Where am I tonight? Play for over. Depends. Will your friend, the football, will be there? Oh, friend! Football friend! You're listening to Football Friends with Ben Garuccio and Stefan Mork. Well, we finally got him, everyone. It's Adelaide United icon and Socceroos favourite Craig Goodwin joining us for a massive episode this week, direct from Saudi Arabia. The boys chat to Craig about life over there amongst the recent Saudi football rise, Craig's rocky, rocky road to kickstart his career, and of course, that World Cup goal, and everything in between. All that and more, coming up on Football Friends. <laughs> and welcome back for another episode of Football Friends with Ben and Steph. I'm definitely the happier of the two this weekend, Easter Monday. I'm still smiling. Um, you've got a cheeky smile as well, which is good. You've finally gotten over the result on Friday night. Um, hard one to take, was it? Yeah, it was a hard. It was a hard one to take, especially considering, I suppose, the position of. Both of our teams at the moment, I think that was quite a big game to maybe catch up on some points. And to be honest, I think probably before the the game the week before, you guys were probably going through your worst spell of the season. So it came at a not bad time to play you. And, and I thought that, that we had a good chance in that game with the way that we'd been playing. But yeah, first 20 minutes were, were okay on our part. And then after that, after the first goal, just not good enough and became probably a bit too stretched in the game and allowed too much space for players like you and Iren Kunda. And yeah, look, we, we, we got punished big time. I think three chances uh, Nesta had and buried all three. And I suppose that's what you get from a player with his quality. But yeah, not good enough from us, but definitely a good result for you boys. And I'm only smiling because I got to spend the weekend in Adelaide. You weren't too harsh on me and we got to relax a little bit and get to hang out with my family as well. So yeah, it was a it was a not bad weekend, but yeah, you've always got that that sour taste in your mouth after a result like that. Yeah, it was um yeah, we same I guess uh same goes with you guys. It's funny. The the table obviously showed we were above you um and you guys were, were on the bottom, but recently you're probably one of the most informed teams. So we knew we knew we had to kind of be on it and getting that Newcastle game, um, the win kind of gave us that little bit more confidence, had the extra week break with the international break. Sometimes there's a bad a bad thing as well because you can lose a bit of rhythm or momentum after, you know, getting on, um, you know, the winning train again for us and you guys were probably, you know, feeling quite good. Um, that's something we tried to really focus on. We had a few days off as well to refresh us during that break. Um, but Cole and the coaches were really big on that take the momentum from the Newcastle game into this. And like you touched on the first 15, 20 minutes, um, up until Benny Wallard went down with that injury, um, you guys were all over us, like the way you were playing out. We, we had prepared a little bit for it but it felt as if you were kind of just getting the overload um, on your right-hand side and we weren't really able to step up onto uh, whether it was Thurgate or, or Pasquale on that side and to Pena and then with Wales coming inside sometimes. It was, yeah, just ruining our press. And actually, like for me, I didn't even get near near the ball in the first 15 or 20 minutes, even like defensively. Like So it was... Um, it was quite frustrating, and I was thinking at the time, like, this is probably the hardest team we've played against in time to, in terms of pressing you and actually getting close to winning it because we've been good at that the last three or four games, even when we were losing. Um, and then Nesta scores a goal out of uh, out of nothing, and the game just changes. Um, and we we speak about it all the time, but momentum in in a game itself in the season, of course, is big. But in the, in, a, in a game. All it takes is, you know, sometimes one one challenge, one tackle, or even if it's a goal, um, and then the other team lifts. And especially at home, Cooper Stadium is is a great place to be when you're at home and you're winning, and um, because the crowd gets behind you. If you're losing, sometimes they can get on your your back. But we were fortunate; we went up, and then start of the second half was crazy. Three goals in about five minutes. Um, but yeah, it was for, for us. I felt really comfortable after that. Probably first twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, I agree. Uh, first, first little bit was good, but yeah, you know, one goal shouldn't change a game that much. I feel like 
we let it affect us way too much, especially with the crowd then coming into it. I think you boys got a massive lift from it. And then I think the rest of the first half was kind of, you know, a bit nip and tuck end to end. You know, we had some chances. So did you guys. You guys were getting us on the counter quite a lot. But yeah, you start that second half, you know, the team talk was, you know, fairly positive for us at half time that we're still in the game. We've got to get a goal back and, you know, see what happens. And then by the time you know it's 3 1 and you're thinking, fuck, you know, find a game over now. So, yeah. yeah, disappointing result. Obviously, I got to wear the brunt of the forfeit, which we still haven't actually decided what that's going to be. But whether it's clean shaving my beard or signing a top and saying that you're a better player than me and that you maybe always both. be able to play, maybe both. Who knows? Uh, yeah, we got a few suggestions, but. Contrary to what was said on social media, I will not be shaving my head because <laughs> my barnet honestly won't grow back. So that's the only reason that, that I'm let's, not doing it. Let's have a look. That, that, that above <laughs> no, angle, if they if they do the um the drone angle like what they've got in the AFL. The, bird, the bird's it, eye, it, the bird's eye view. It'd be a disaster. Be it's a not, disaster. it's so not happy we don't have the money. It's not happy viewing for me, to be fair, when I watch the games back these days, but right maybe um maybe our next sponsor on the pod can be uh some doctors from turkey that can give me a hair transplant so this guy obviously put it out there on paramount after the game that you know i was going to turkey in the off season so <laughs> it's out there now so we can um there's no harm in me talking about it but yeah that's uh <laughs> that's enough of that of that game yeah. fucking shit game. i probably yeah i probably stitched you up with that as well like after a game when you're meant to be like obviously you're cooking inside and you're pissed off and i'm buzzing so i don't care what i say and then you yeah. you come on to get the interview from uh from lucas Rinaldi and he's, he's questioning you thanks for the shout out as well paramount plus and channel 10 um and then they're questioning you about the barnet and you're trying not to laugh but yeah the question he was questioning me about the forfeit like i oh, so i heard the forfeit you got to shave your head and i'm thinking like I've just been fucking smashed four one. Like I'm not going to be talking about the forfeit that we're doing on the podcast. <laughs> Although it's a bit of banter, yeah, it's a bit of banter now, and it's a bit of banter last week when we're talking about it. But at the current moment, straight after the game, like I can't be talking about that. So I just absolutely gave it the straight bat. Said that you know I'll, I'll mull over it over the weekend and and we'll discuss it now on the podcast. So I think I've got away with it, all right. But yeah, fucking hell, I don't know if um. I don't know if the coach would be too happy if, yeah, he heard me having a laugh about potentially shaving my head straight after the game. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's a bit tricky sometimes with, with media, but uh, got away yeah. with that one. Well, well, we'll um, we'll move on. Um, we'll just quickly touch on the other games before we, we get on to our very special guest. It was actually the first guest that we wanted of the season after the big fallout from Adelaide United, um, but didn't line up well. And, and now we've finally got him on. He's, he's obviously in some good form. But before we get to Goody, um, you know, the other results of of the weekend. Um, firstly, um, I guess, I don't know how much you saw of all the games being down here visiting different people, but um, Newcastle against City, a bit of a, a bit of a snore fest, the old nil-nil draw, which... Um, is a good result for us and I guess potentially for you as well if you're trying to climb off the bottom. Um, Newcastle didn't get the win and City didn't get the three points. They they dominated and um, and your mate, uh, Scotty, with the, the celebration after saving... Who, who was it? Who took the shot? I don't even know. It was Yarkula ya- stole it from, stole it from um, our boy Tarsley. <laughs> and he was... he was on the floor smashing the ground with his hands doing the old Hulk smash, what I used to do when I was younger. Yeah. And Scotty is just running off around him yeah. like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Honestly, fucking all time, all time. And, uh, and he, put on his, he put on his story last night. Like, you know, if you can't enjoy yourself at work, then there's no point in doing it. So fucking yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. That was, that was, um, it was pretty good. And you know what? Like, again, they're coming near the bottom, Newcastle. It's not a great time for them. But during the actual matches itself, like you've got to have a bit of fun. Of course, you're never trying to lose or whatever. And after the game and the interviews, you have to be serious sometimes depending on it. But like, you know, that that stuff there is, you know, you play because you love it and you enjoy it. And um, I don't think any fan would be watching that and be getting upset because that's a, you know, a grind of a win, a, a draw, sorry, nil-nil away to City. It's a good point for them. Um, and while we don't have relegation, the, you know, the, the negativity of being near the bottom isn't as harsh 
the punishment. So um, good to see he's having a bit of fun out there. I don't know if he would have been doing the same dance if uh, Nuno Racer's goal didn't get called offside. Because he <laughs> yeah. let the absolute yeah. key roller past him. But to be fair, that's that's football. <laughs> gets called offside. Uh, and then they you go on to the slow ball. The... Yeah, that's exactly right. you got to watch out <laughs> for the slow ball sometimes. You know, he, he played cricket his whole childhood. So, um, yeah, no, it was, it, it was all a good laugh from Scotty. He's, he's always good value. But the next game, Sydney uh, beat... Central Coast, again, 2-0. Uh, I still think that they're probably one of the most dangerous teams and I don't think there's many teams in finals that would want to play them. Joel King got his first A-League goal, which I was pretty surprised at. I didn't know he hadn't scored, but had two bites of the cherry, hit the first one well, and then managed to hit the second one in better and got it in. Yeah, yeah, no, big big three points for them. The, the last probably, we probably last three spots, you could say, three to four. Yeah, three spots. I think it's MacArthur around 35, Western Sydney potentially 34, City are on 30 maybe, um, and Sydney are on 34 as well. So those last two spots, or three spots, sorry, four, four five, six, um, are still anyone's game really. Like us at Adelaide, we, we think we're good enough to win all these last five games and that takes us to 40 points. We're doing one game at a time, of course, you know, not focusing too much on, on on all of the games at once, of course. But, you know, we get to 40 points. We think we've got a good chance, but I'm sure there's another four or five teams that think the same thing. So it's um it's gonna be interesting down the the last couple of spots in the finals and then and then top spot as well, um, with uh, with Wellington getting the win. Um the early game on, on Easter Sunday, they they beat Brisbane Raw one nil. A massive um, three points for them. I guess you've got, uh, you know, Brisbane Raw who are pushing for that final spot, but at home, Wellington probably expected to win that game. They did it the hard way with, with getting uh, the red card roofer sent off. Um, but the last 10 minutes, they were they were solid enough. And, um, you know, they, they go into their next game. I think it's away in Central Coast. They're six points clear of Central Coast. They played an extra game. Um, but if they win that game against Central Coast, you'd almost say that's that's the Premier's play. Um, nine, if you get nine points clear, um, it's probably going to be very, very hard for them to lose it from that. Yeah, for sure. I think everyone's been talking about the whole season, you know, when is Wellington going to slip up or when is Central Coast going to, you know, come off the boil a little bit. But I think everyone's kind of just been waiting for one of the usual suspects like a Melbourne City, like a Sydney FC, but Melbourne Victory, one of those big hitters to come through and sort of break away from the pack, but it just hasn't happened. And for me right now, I can't actually see Wellington not winning it. Uh, if not, maybe Central Coast, but I just think, you know, Central Coast will probably look a little bit weaker than, than Wellington have, uh, especially probably in the recent weeks. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, Barbarous has had that offside goal, uh, where he had, I can't remember, was it, who was it? Was it Truen? Uh, on the, doing 360s, chopped him a few times and uh, put it in. for a hot got, dog. Yeah, sent him for an absolute hot dog, but got called offside. And then the next game was was victory versus Perth, 2-1 for victory. Bruno Fonaroli's show once again, which has been quite standard this season, to be honest. I can't remember how many times we've actually spoken about him. Yeah. What is this? Is that 16? 16 goals from or 17? Yeah, 16 or 17. But... I think 16, but it's, um, yeah. he's. Um, I, I guess the only downside for, for victory, you'd say, is really just the lack of goals from elsewhere. Um, at the end of the day, if he keeps scoring, it doesn't actually matter. But, um, you know, an injury to him or, or suspension potentially in the finals and, um, you know, you, you're not really sure probably where else the goals will come from. They've got the talent there. They definitely have the firepower, but for some reason, it's just Bruno... <laughs> Bruno scoring, um, but yeah, they they probably secured their spot. You'd think in the finals that I think they went to thirty eight points, so they only need to really win one of their last uh, five or six games, and, and they'll cement that spot. But they'll be pushing probably for that top two spot. You want the first week off, so it's it's going to be really interesting um, the run in, and then just before the uh, the game that was played on um, on on Monday. Um, Western Sydney 3-1 against MacArthur, which was a little bit of a shock. Um, after watching the first 45 minutes, it looked like the Bulls 
would win that one. Um, and then Western Sydney came out. Uh, Milanovic uh, maybe could be a, a potential guest for us, I reckon, if he keeps up this form. Um, yeah. And he's he's come off the bench, scored an absolute thunderbolt, top corner. Second one, he puts it on a platter for, uh, I think it was Kittel. Um, nice nice exchange down the left side with him, Hendricks and Clisby. Um, and then the third goal was a, it was a top finish by by Hendricks himself. So West Sydney um, kind of, yeah, looked down and out in that game. And then within the space of 15 minutes, they go 3-0 up. And now they've always almost shot themselves back into finals contention as well. Yeah, the, it's kind of like their season, I suppose. You think they're out of it, then they're back in, then they're out. I think they just they've just struggled all season with that putting results really wins together and being super consistent because for me, they're, they're still one of the strongest teams. If you look at their squad on paper, it's definitely one of the strongest in the league, but they've just been so up and down. Well, on that and... in that game, they had, it was off the bench. You had Milanovic, Dylan Preas, um, you had Tate Russell on the bench, Lockie Brook on the bench. Yeah. Um, who else was it that came on? can't even remember but like you know Lockie Brooks been in good form he scored a lot of goals this year like and Milanovic scored a lot of goals and they're both on the bench because obviously you know Rudin's not happy with something and he and he played Ninkovic to start off with in Cattell um and Thompson Varela like they've got so many good attacking players so yeah it's it's probably just finding the right combination um that works uh and sometimes in the A-League when you've got good depth and it creates problems for the coach. Um, sometimes it can be a bad thing because you never actually, yeah, you play the right players or people are upset that they're not starting. Um, to keep the squad happy is not always easy. But if they if they hit form at the right time, um, which it seems like, you know, I think they've won their last two now, um, you know, they go on a bit of a run here. In finals, they're, they're dangerous. And, and I reckon once it does get to finals, it really is any team, you know, can win it um, in the format that it is. You play the the home and away leg for the the semi final. It's going to be very very interesting, and um, and I hope us Reds are, are a part of it. To be honest, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. It's getting it is getting close now. There's not really too much time left to start, you know, making that surge for that you know fifth sixth spot, whatever it is. But it's going to be an interesting run into the finals. But that's the review done for the week. We need to get to our boy Craig Goodwin. He's waiting for us right now. What a great cross! And a goal! Craig Goodwin! And volleyed in by Craig Goodwin! Extraordinary! Goodwin has scored! And he is some player. And welcoming today's guest, Johnny Warren, medalist and A-League star, just been away with the Socceroos, scored an absolute worldie, so very welcome to Craig Goodwin. Hey guys, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. Now how we are you? um We wanted to get you on. I think you were actually the number one guest we wanted from the start, especially with uh, the bit of uh, stuff that went on just before the season commenced with Adelaide. Um, but now, just off the, the back of scoring... Scoring a couple of goals on international break. Um, obviously, your family's still in Adelaide. You're back in Saudi. So we thought you'd be bored and, and you'd be able to spare some time for us. So it's worked out perfectly. Yeah, it has definitely got a little bit of spare time with the, the family being away. And also, it's uh, Ramadan, um, obviously, over in the Middle Middle East and then the world. So, you know, everything's on shutdown here. So there's not much to do during the day because we train at night time at 10 p.m. Come out. So... That's every day at the moment, training 10 p.m. That's been, what now, a couple of weeks for Ramadan? Yeah, well, lucky, I mean, lucky for me anyway, I, I missed out on probably a couple of weeks with the international window. So, yeah, the boys have been training 10 p.m. Um, every single every single day. Um, and especially, um, we're based in Mecca uh, as well, which is an hour, hour and a half um, with bad traffic away from where the majority of the players live in Jeddah. Um, because you can't, they obviously have the rule that, you know, non-Muslims can't live inside Mecca. So um, we commute up there for training. So it's, it's a, I guess, kind of a long, a long period um, during, during uh, Ramadan with the training and everything at night. So I get home about 2am, you know, body clock's a bit, um, a bit shot in terms of, you know, the, I guess the usual thing that I would do. That's why it's probably, 
I mean, at the moment during Ramadan, lucky that my family's not here because, you know, my boy would be up from 6 a.m. and, and running a market. I'll be operating on three, four hours sleep every night. So it's, it's <laughs> nice to, to be okay from that side. Yeah, it's crazy. Like even just small things. Every country obviously has different challenges culturally and, um, you know, it's tough for tough for Aussies going, you know, to a foreign like lang- uh, country where they speak a different language. But something like this is is not really something you'd think about if you're a fan. You know, someone back in Australia that's thinking, oh yeah, goodies, it's over in Saudi. But you know, that would be hard. Like for me, I'm in bed at eight thirty, even even with the baby now. <laughs> maybe maybe even earlier to be honest. But if I'm training at ten o'clock, playing games, then to to adjust your body must be really hard and is this something i guess you you learned from your first in here kind of how to deal with that yeah definitely a little bit um i think i'm obviously coming here um this time around uh, i already knew the kind of challenges i would experience and it's, it's kind of hard to to explain to people some of the some of the challenges and difficulties you face but everything is just so different over here and they operate in a completely different way and it's you know, a lot of the times you, you'll hear uh, regularly like them say, like, don't worry, inshallah, don't worry, inshallah. Like it's like, means God willing and, and stuff like that. But, you know, you can have so many little off the field problems or off the field differences. And because of the communication barrier and, and you know, how relaxed they are at, at times, you know, nothing really gets done. So, you know, aside from like those kind of challenges, yeah, definitely when it comes to, to obviously, you know, training and, and playing at 10 p.m. And, and that side of thing, it, it is really challenging, you know, especially um, when you go on international break and then come back um, and then there's a jet lag to, to deal with as well, obviously playing the game a, a few days later and then playing uh, one yesterday as, as well. So it's, yeah, it's definitely challenging from that aspect, but it is, like you said, like it's the small things that you don't think of when you're, even when you're, you're coming um, and doing these types of moves, you know, there's so many cultural challenges and, and off the field challenges that you just don't think about as a player, because at the end of the day, you're thinking like, all right, what's, what's the city like? Is it going to be, is it going to be all right? What's the football like? You know, and most of the time you base everything off of your, your football and, and what's it going to be like for your career and, and everything like that. So you know, it's lucky this time knowing um, the challenges I'll face and especially having a family this time around too. Yeah, I think, I think especially when you're younger, the football definitely comes first. I think you would sacrifice a lot to go to somewhere where you think that it's going to be beneficial for your career, whether that's in terms of money or opportunity, potentially in playing in Europe and, and you've done that as well. But obviously uh, you're there now, you're, you're 32 uh, let's go back, kind of rewind a little bit back to the start, your junior days. Obviously, you're a an Adelaide boy like us. I think the, you're only the second second guest from Adelaide. We had big Joe Gouch here and now you. So uh, we're we're pretty familiar with the junior kind of setup in Adelaide. But how was that for you? How did football come about for you? And where did you kind of start? And when did you start to realize that you were half decent at it? Yeah, for me, I mean, um, I got into to football because um, I had an older brother, four years older, um, and he was he obviously started playing, and I wanted to play, um, you know, just to obviously try and be like him and, and stuff like that. And my dad promoted it as well. My dad actually has a more of a AFL and cricket background, um, but as uh, my mum felt that AFL was too rough, um, we put we went in the direction of um, of uh, football. Um, yeah, so here my brother started playing, and then I started playing as a junior, four years old at, at Manapara, um, and I was there till under twelves, um, and probably, probably I reckon probably around the time of like twelve, thirteen, you know, when you start to obviously have the opportunity to to trial for for state teams and and stuff like that. I think. Um, you know, when when you're younger, you don't think necessarily in, in those younger ages. Um, oh, I'm I'm really good, or I'm better than than him or, or them. You know, but I think once you hit that round and start to get into that te- teenage years, you obviously know by then. And I think I knew pretty early on that you know football was what I wanted to do. So, you know, at um at t- after I was tw- twelve at Manapara, then I went to Parra Hills and played there for three years for under 13s to 15s. I was in the under 13 state team 
and under 14 state team. Um, I got cut from the under 15s for the, the nationals um, or whatever it was at the time. Uh, me and me and three other players, um, and it just so worked out that we were the three smallest players um, in the group at the time. Um, and then from there, in terms of just Adelaide, um, I went to Enfield after Para Hills um, for a couple of years and played under 19s and a, and a couple of senior games, and then played my seniors at, at Raiders um, from 16, 17 for a couple of years before going to Melbourne. Um, and playing locally with Oakley Cannons after missing out on Adelaide United youth team two years in a row. Um, the second year, I was even in the team photo and still missed out on the on the squad, which is pretty humiliating. Um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, in, in between that as well, also had stints where I went overseas and, and trialed um, at a couple of trials at, at Crystal Palace. I think one when I was. Um, 14, 15, and, and they said um, to come back next year and, and try out for the academy. Um, and then I went back over, um, trialed with them again. Um, I trialed at Fulham, sorry, previous uh, previously to that too, got rejected, trialed at Crystal Palace. Um, and they were showing interest um, to be able to, to go there. Um, but then as we were as we were working out the, the time periods um, in terms of their academy and stuff, their school years go different and the, the way in which they regard players' ages are different to here and my birthday's in December. So um, I don't know the, the complete logistics of it, but you have to ask my dad for that one. He knows much better. But basically, I missed out because my birthday deemed that I was in an older year bracket, uh, which means I would have had to <coughs> trial for um, the youth team or the, the reserves. So... Again, I went back a, a year later to trial um, with the reserves uh, and I did really well. And at the end of it, they said, look, we're, we're happy with you, but the first team coach wants us to sign a striker and a centre back. So we only have two spots left, so we're not going to sign you. Um, and then as well, um, I also had a trial with Inverness in Scotland and there I did get a reserves or a, a youth contract. Um, and I was supposed to go back. It was literally halfway through year 12. Um, so uh, that timing, I was like 17, turning 18, um, and was going to go over for their, their youth uh, system. And I literally did half, a, I did half a year of year 12, and throughout the period was like, why am I even here? I'm just going to go over there and, and do schooling there. This is such a waste of time. And then as it got to the period that I was uh, supposed to go over, Inverness uh, got relegated from the first division um, on the last day of the season. And then we got a phone call from the, the youth director and he said that the clubs decided to cut the entire youth system to save money so that they can have the potential to go back up. So again, that voided, voided me contract. And um, obviously that was, you know, that was um, after then, I was uh, trialling with, with Adelaide United youth team around that time too. So I ended up having to do a full year, a year 12 in half a year um, and just passed, didn't do any of the exams, which is, you know, I think was nice for me, not having that stress of, of that side of thing, but had different stress of trying to, you know, just finish my, my studies and and that, that side of thing. So, yeah, basically, you know, that they're kind of, the, I guess that, that's my pathway to it. Obviously, after the, after that, missing out on the Lead United youth team, going to Melbourne, playing locally, uh, getting uh, getting a contract with Melbourne Heart youth team with, with John Aloisi as the coach, and, and then from there being able to, to make my debut. Yeah, absolutely crazy. crazy. Yeah, like I, <laughs> I think the, 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 one, the one thing like for me that's – everybody's got a different pathway, um, but seems like there was a lot of, a lot of rejection – um, you know, whether it was going, and, you know, you obviously wanted to push yourself. You wanted to go on trial overseas. Um, but you know, the youth team, the state teams, uh, Adelaide United, uh, Fulham Palace, these things that kind of probably could have made other players just give up and think, you know what, I'm not going to bother about this. I'm just going to play state league, go out with my friends on the weekend party, whatever it is. Um, but you obviously had the desire to make it. And I think, you know, you, you can see it in, in the way that you play. And um, probably a lot of young players listening to this should take, you know, that rejection in a good way because it builds that character. Um, but when you did finally go to Melbourne um, and you got your chance with, with Melbourne Heart, 
did you did you feel that pressure inside like this could be my one chance um to actually play or you, you weren't even thinking you know in in the future you were just worried about that being there and and you know playing that the game itself um yeah i reckon i reckon to be fair there was there was that bit of pressure um you know obviously but by that time i was you know probably about 19 and and you know i think you guys will know as well you're a couple of years younger than me but during that time period really the only pathway of getting into to any senior you know a league football was through the youth team and you know being able to to be there it was very very scarce the amount of players that have come through the the MPL and and you know made the jump from from that um from that pathway so for me it was just about you know trying something different you know i played a couple of years at raiders I couldn't make the youth team two years in a row. You know, I was pretty pissed off by the fact that I hadn't made the youth team. Um, you know, and obviously being involved in, like I said before, being involved in a team photo and, and you know, going that far into the process, you know, if you're in a team photo, you're thinking like, yeah, I'm going to be in the squad. And then, Do you reckon it was just you know, for your looks they got you in there for, the team <laughs> photo? I don't know. It might have been. It might have been. They never told me. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, like, like I said, you know, you know, you go through, like you said, you go through the, that rejection. Um, but for me, it was, you know, the only thing that I ever wanted to do. And I never really had a plan B. And, you know, you'd have, my parents asking me, like, well, what do you what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to do if it doesn't work out? And, you know, my thought process was always like, fuck that. It's not, yeah. it's not, not working out. I'm not, yeah. I'm not doing something else. So, and I think definitely like moving to Melbourne and then, you know, being out of my own, um, not having my, my family and friends around, but also having to, you know, pick up a job and, and, you know, work, um, work from, you know, work, work from a different angle as, as well. You know, I picked up a job at KFC to, to pay my, my rent, and my bills, you know, I was still borrowing money off my, my parents at, at that time as well. Um, but it was just, you know, I guess definitely that pressure and that realization of going like, you know, time could be ticking out here, but, at the same time, just trying to, you know, go through um, the new challenge um, and just see how it goes, you know, going to Oakley with, with Arthur Pappas. And, you know, I'll be honest, it probably wasn't until then, until I was about, about 18, 19, that I really started to learn more in-depth football tactics and, and everything like that. Um, so it, it definitely was challenging. And I think for sure that there was that pressure at, at that time to go, you know, I don't know if this is going to work out, but obviously as a... It started to, you know, play games in the, the MPL and, and get noticed and, and recognise and get that opportunity with Melbourne Heart. Then I guess the, the opportunity started to flow from there. But, you know, even when I was with Melbourne Heart, you know, before my debut, I'd only trained with the first team maybe six or seven times before I'd made my debut. And, and it was really like the week before where Aziz Bay, it's Jason, Jason Hoffman and, and someone else um, went away with the Oli Roos. And they brought me in to train with the first team. And, and it was after a week of, of training with the first team that John Van Skip said, I'm, I'm going to start you in the derby um, at left back. So, you know, it was, um, yeah, definitely, definitely during that period. Uh, absolutely, there was pressure. Um, but at the same time, you know, when, you, when you're a bit younger, I, I think you're not as wise to that, that pressure or, or what it is as well. Yeah, that's, it's absolutely correct. I, I think that's just, your pathway is ridiculous. Like that's crazy because I went through. You know, everyone's been through setbacks. All all footballers, all players, whether you make it professionally or not, and you get told you're not good enough along the way. And I look, I remember back to some of mine, and I think, you know, that was the worst time ever. But when you look back now, are you actually grateful for all those setbacks? Do you think it's actually made your skin that little bit thicker than someone that maybe had the easier route to, you know, staying in Adelaide? being with the youth team, going straight into the first team and not having to maybe go through all those hard times to then actually appreciate the chance that you got given with Melbourne Heart? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think all of those challenges from the younger ages and, and rejection has, you know, helped me later on in my career as well. And <clears throat> and you guys will know, you know, you face difficult periods, you know, trying to get there, but it's just as hard trying to stay at the top and trying to, reach new heights and, and play at different levels and when you're playing as a pro it's you know when you or when you make it as a pro that doesn't just mean that all your 
you know, rejection um, and challenges in, in your career are, are, are going to be gone just because you're playing at a professional level. It's, it's harder than, than what it is in, in trying to get there. Um, so absolutely, um, I'm grateful for the way, um, for the pathway that I had. And I, I get that it's, it's probably very different to a lot of young players. But, you know, I think it definitely gave me that appreciation to, to not take um, anything for granted and to really try and earn um, earn my place. Uh, and that's something that I think I've consistently done and, and never been happy with, even when I'm, when I'm playing or, or starting, um, being able to, to find that mentality of, I'm never being comfortable in your position and never being, you know, um, contend that, oh, I'm starting, I'll play every week or that's fine. I don't need to try. I don't need to push myself or, you know, or, from the flip side of when I'm not playing, just thinking like, oh, I should be playing. Oh, I should be starting. Why aren't I playing? You know, I've always had, I think, through my challenges, that that work ethic of like, I'm going to prove people wrong. I'm going to I'm going to get better. I'm going to better myself. I'm going to prove it to myself if I can't, you know, technically do something. You know, I'd be out there working at it to try and make sure that, that it is better. Um, so, yeah, 100% all of those challenges have definitely I've benefited greatly from. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's it. I think to be honest, that's one of the biggest things. What well, you touched on at the end is when when you're not playing as well. Uh, you know, you get to the professional setup set up, and now it's easier for young kids to get there because of A League uh, budgets being cut, and I think also A League teams realizing the uh, the potential to sell players overseas to to increase revenue. And I completely understand it. You know, all of us probably would have been playing a lot younger playing more games at younger ages if it was like that, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, but I also think on the flip side, it's a bad thing because they get given their chance potentially when they haven't earned it. And that doesn't mean they're not good players, but they haven't worked hard in training for a year, two years, three years to earn their spot. Um, and, you know, you maybe get left out of the squad when you deserve to be playing, but it makes you work harder at training. So when you get your chance, you take it and um, and that's something I've seen you, you know, always practicing, whether it was the early days at Adelaide, practicing free kicks, you're shooting before training. Um, people just see the end result, you know, with your crossing and, and your shooting and think, oh, he's got a great left foot. That's that's unbelievable. He's technically gifted. But, you know, you're gifted because you actually put in the work to improve it. Um, and that's that's something that I think a lot of the young players really need to take and keep on improving. And probably the strength and conditioning coaches need to not be not be so busy to tell us to get in after training and, and let us actually uh, practice a bit more. But we'll we'll go on because I won't touch too much on the Jets' time. Um, we've got a few questions which we might touch on at the end. Um, but you came back to Adelaide, did the full kind of 360 where you've gone away from the youth team. You, f- you finally you know got back and been in the team photo and then actually been able to play for the team. Um, so you you're back at the Reds. Uh, we'll go we'll go to the championship year. Um, which was a big year. You, you obviously were one of the best players then. Uh, was that when you kind of felt like, you know, I, I belong in this league, I can be an influential player and one of the best players? And, and what was it, I guess, that made you play so well consistently um, in that year? Um, yeah, look, I think um, definitely coming back to, to Adelaide for those, those couple of years um, after Newcastle was a big confidence boost for me. Um, Obviously, I broke on. I broke onto the scene um, with the four games of Melbourne Heart, and then went to Newcastle. And I think I had a really good first season, but second season, um, I struggled a bit. Um, didn't play as, didn't start as many games, and and I think coming back to Adelaide, I think was just the probably the, the perfect timing and, and perfect style of football for me to play. Um, at this point in my career, I was still trying to fight against being a left back because I didn't want to be. Um, I didn't want to have, uh, I guess, ben have that doesn't tag. Either. Yeah, <laughs> I, still I, I didn't still fucking won the fight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't want to have that failed winger tag um, <laughs> on my name. So, no, nah, it's definitely, yeah, definitely, it worked out really well. I, I think you know, throughout those two years, I played a lot of games at, at left back, and I played a lot of games at, at wing, and even in that championship year, a few games on on the right wing as well. But I think probably the last. The last eight or nine games, I played um, left back um, every game because Tarek Elridge got injured. Um, so, I think, to be honest, I think the the biggest thing was it was the style of football that that we played, and <clears throat> obviously we had a, a fantastic team. But 
you know, going into to that team, obviously it was a great environment, but football wise, I think it suited me to a T the style of football that I, I like to play. Um, you know, and, and especially at a young, younger age, you know, having, uh, I guess more, more energy, more directness, um, you know, being in that, in that wider area, um, whether I was playing left back or wing, I'd have so much of the ball in, in that front third, um, you know, a lot of, I guess, early crosses and, and the system, you know, suited me really well. I think f- for me, I, I don't think it was really anything like mentally or or anything like that that I, I had to work on or change. I think just the pure style of football and, and obviously comfortableness of, of being back home. Um, but it just started to, to I guess, to... To flourish, but I mean, as as you'll know, Steph, that that championship year wasn't all uh, wasn't all roses. I mean, actually, you won't know because you weren't there for the first half, would you? You would have been on the outside. You <laughs> didn't. You didn't. Did, did, yeah, he just gave and picked up the trophy at the end. He'll <laughs> score, score a few goals. No, nah, definitely. Yeah. That that started that started the year. We went we went winless in eight games, and you know we don't we don't often get people at the Adelaide United training ground but we had a couple of people on the outside of the fence screaming at us telling us all sorts of things how shit we are and, and stuff like that so a long drive out to out to play for it as well <laughs> yeah. might have just been it might have just been a local walking past and seeing <laughs> us and just throwing 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 shit at us so nah um it was it was definitely I guess the start of that year was challenging but obviously everything just started to, to click into place and and obviously at the, at the time when, when you came in you made a big impact as, as well and and everything just seemed to, to flow for us that season and, and it's probably a similar story for myself in, in terms of performances that year. Yeah. You got obviously rewarded your first move overseas straight after that season. Uh, you went to <laughs> Sp- it was Sparta Rotterdam, was it? Yeah, in Holland was that with were you with Kenny Dougal there? Yes, yeah, yeah, was with Kenny. Yeah, sorry. You went over there. Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Obviously, you you just broken onto the scene. You probably had your one or two years now where you really feel like you're you're hitting your straps and starting to reach your full potential. <clears throat> what was it like to move overseas, and how how challenging was that for you at that time? Um, yeah, initially, you know, it was it was brilliant. You know, you you get the chance, the the opportunity, I guess, the dream to to move overseas. It's everything that you you dream of as a kid. So, you know, you you're like a I guess a little kid in a candy shop going over there, so excited, smiling all the time, just buzzing to to get into everything, experience I guess the the uh, different cultural things of of living in Europe, experiencing European football, um, the passion that they have, the support that they have within within the crowds and. You know, just that the football is the number one thing over there, and it's such a nice um, thing to to be a part of. You know, everywhere you go on on the TVs and in, in bars or cafes and, and everything, people are talking about football. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's on it's on all the TVs. You know, everything you do, it's football related, and yeah, it's such a nice experience. And you know, going going over there, um, my first year went went really well. Um, but this was Steph was there at the same time, and I'm, I think we probably spoke about this. Is you know playing and training on astroturf can can take its toll, especially when you're not used to it. So, for a large majority of um, my time there, um, although I was able to play um, a lot of games, I had shin splints almost the entire time, and and struggled from from that aspect of trying to get the body right because we would train and play on astroturf, and you know in the summer it's it's really hot and your feet burn on that but in the winter the the pitches freeze and they're even harder and slipperier than than what they are so you know that was that was definitely challenging um but you know the first first season that i did really well i think i had you know, four goals uh six assists from from the first season alone and <coughs> you sent um, us down you sent us down on the last I day did. by scoring I against did. fucking go ahead eagles i Look did in- my career could have been so different over there. And you're fucking like seventy packing. <laughs> yes, the you didn't have enough power. That's what the coach told you. That was definitely. Um, if I think back to my, my time here, that that was definitely the highlight. You know, obviously struggling a little bit through with the shin splints and stuff, but still playing. You know, whether it be minutes off the bench or starting games. And and I remember this last game against Go Ahead, we had to win to avoid going into the the relegation playoffs and. We were, um, you know, tied with uh, Go Ahead Eagles away, and I, I started on the bench, and I, I came on at, at half time, um, and I ended up 
uh, getting two assists and, and scoring, um, and we won three one. So it was a really nice uh, moment to to celebrate, obviously with the with the supporters and, and stuff like that. But it was also um, it was also that period was actually the same time that Feyenoord had won the won the league for the first time in about eighteen years, and and we were out in Rotterdam after that, and there was literally over two hundred thousand people in, in the city centre. Um, going nuts for for fire and ord. Every pub was packed, every street was packed, roads were closed, and you know it was a nice experience to 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 see like that football culture. Yeah, you think fucking hell, I, I only scored to keep us fucking out of relegation. Why would this be? Yeah, well, they definitely were chatting um, Dirk Cout's name and, and everyone else. So it wasn't it wasn't me. They said, they were great goo, great goo. <laughs> Nah, it's um, um, it's yeah, it's actually crazy. Like both at that time period, like we were we were both over there, and Ben, you'd know from being in Scotland. Um, it's so tough being overseas because you had again different challenges. You know, Saudi at the moment was presenting different situations for you, but over there, you know, it's, it's a foreign language, first time being overseas, different playing surfaces, um, different mentality. To be honest, Australia is uh, it's very easy here because that's just the way we make it. Um, and if you're a good player and you work hard. You should get opportunities. But over there, you know, everybody's, every player's pretty even. You know, the squad's 20, 25 players and, um, you know, relegation is is a thing that, you know, creates this pressure within the club, within the playing group. And um, I don't care how you play. It's not about, oh, we're going to try and play out from the back. It's not, no, fuck that. We want to win. And we got stopped actually. Um, you're talking Adelaide United. A um, couple of fans out the side. We got stopped. I don't know if you did, but it was a couple of times on the bus on the way back. We got stopped by the fans at the stadium. And we had to wait till the police came um, to let us off safely. And then another time, the coach got out and tried to speak to and I'm thinking, "Fuck me! Like we just we just lost the game. Like who cares?" But for them, that's that's everything. That's their their, their livelihood. All they care about. So um, experiencing that with you, obviously, I remember going to Rotterdam, sleeping on your couch. Um, night out was good. Um, so at least yeah, we, I think we you knocked to... me off my bike. <laughs> you knocked me off my bike, if you remember correctly. <laughs> oh, that was. Oh, that was quality, but I think it was a bit slippery then, maybe. So um, it was a little bit, <laughs> or maybe it was the the fifteen beers. But we um, we got to experience that together, and then after after you spent the couple of years there, you come back to Adelaide, um, and that's really when you did uh, kick on. Um, you obviously were playing a bit more on the wing. Was it Marco Kurtz that was the coach then? Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely, that was the time that that. Um, you know, I guess I kind of kicked on, obviously started to contribute a lot more. Um, but to be honest, I, I had a lot of motivation going into that season. Um, the second season at Sparta didn't go um, exactly as, as I'd hoped. Again, I was struggling with the shin splints the first half of the year. And um, we'd, we'd probably struggled a little bit as a team, um, but I was playing every game and, and doing doing reasonably okay. Um, at this point, I was pretty much in, in every, um, you know, national team squad. Um, but there was a long period between there from like 2016 to 2018 where I was in all the squads. Um, I was there for, you know, the qualifying against Honduras, um, uh, against uh, Syria, against all those games I was there. Um, and then obviously um, just never played um, in those matches. So obviously, you know, had that desire to try and make that, that World Cup squad um, having been involved in it. But the second year at Sparta, after after the I guess the the winter break, you know they sacked the coach and they brought in uh, Dick Advocate, who brought in thirteen new players, um, and I went from a position of, of playing all the time to to not playing at all, um, and even to the point where you know in training he was playing me as a centre back in the second team, and literally I'd, I'd be on the bench and and during training I was literally playing centre back and. You know, th- during that uh, winter period, obviously he'd, he'd come in, and um, you know, I, I'd spoken to him and said, like, look, uh, I can understand it. You've come in, you've brought in your own new players, um, but if there's an opportunity for for, for me to go, um, then I'd like to go because you know I've been involved in in every um, every camp leading up to to this World Cup squad, and, and if I'm playing, um, you know, I've got the chance to to be there and and, and go to the World Cup. So. You know, he was to be fair at the time. He was he was good about it with the the conversation and said, "Yeah, look for me. I'm 
I'm, I'm going to play my players and I'm, I'm not going to start you. So if there is an opportunity, it's going to be off the bench. And, and if you want to leave, you can leave. So I thought, yeah, great. All right, let's let's speak with the club and, and my agent to try and work out something to, to leave. Um, and then uh, after speaking to the club, they, they said, no, you're not going anywhere. You're a required player. Ah. And so <clears throat> for the entire, I guess, um, uh, transfer window during that period was, was me trying to be like, well, hey, he's not going to play me. And he said that, you know, let's let's let me leave so I can try and make this World Cup squad. And, um, you know, I think they had the intention to try and, you know, get some money or, or sell me on. Um, and there was a, there was a, a couple um, of sniffs of, of interest. Um, but the feedback I'd gotten from, from my agent was like, no, they're not going to sell you. They're not going to sell you. And then as it got later on into the, the, to the window, you know, I think I had the, the opportunity where, um, Uruwa Red Diamonds were, were interested and, and wanted to see me play. Um, they came to a game, um, but I didn't play. So they obviously didn't take the option to, to or the chance to, to sign me. Um, then I had the option to, to go on loan, but the club wanted the loan fee. Um, but the, the loan fee they put on it, nobody wanted to, to pay the loan fee. So I ended up getting stuck there for, um, you know, that last period of the season. Um, uh, with not playing, not playing many games, only a couple of games off the bench here or there, and and then with, uh, I think it was maybe a, a month left to go of the season, a, a new director came into um, the club, and he called me into the office, and he said, "I'm just been going back through through emails exchanged between um, the club and, and your agent, and to be honest, I, I can't understand um, why why this has happened or the situation's panned out that way." Um, but if you want to, if you want to leave, um, if you want to leave on a free, you can leave now. If not, um, you'll be, you'll be contracted for for next season and <clears throat> and blah blah blah. And you know, at that point, you know, I'd gone through you know probably four or five months of literally playing, you know, centre back, left back, defensive mid um, in um, in training uh, and doing you know obviously the the hard yards of you know playing second fiddle, but you know, not even be given the opportunity in my, my own position or, or anything like that. So I took the option to, to leave and, and then from there was working out, do I want to take a sideways step in, in Europe? Um, you know, at this point I was 26, uh, turning 27. If I've taken another sideways step in Europe, I, I don't know, you know, is that option going to be available or do I come back to, to Adelaide where I feel um, like I can potentially you know, have a good year and, and try and kick on and, and, you know, perhaps go back over there. And that's when I, I obviously came back, um, you know, played with, with uh, Marco Kurz and, and had a really good year. Ended up, I think, with the, the cup and the league, scoring 15 goals, getting nine assists, um, and then obviously had the, the option to, to go to Saudi. But I think I came into that season with a lot of motivation and a lot of desire and, and put in a lot of work, um, you know, off the pitch, um, during that off season and pre season to give myself a good foundation coming into that season. So you came back, went to Saudi, came back again, won the Johnny Warren, <laughs> went back to Saudi. And yeah, so um, how, how I don't know, like for me, for as an outsider, I'm sure everyone's kind of the same. Like, how does that happen? Like, how do you go over to Saudi? Did they, what happened? Like, did they get rid of you? They didn't want you or you just wanted to come back to Adelaide? And then how did you end up back at the same club? Because that's like quite bizarre in football to go to a club, leave and then go back to the same club. Unless you're obviously coming back to, you know, like an Adelaide United where, you know, that's obviously where you're from and there's higher levels that you can go around the world. Yeah, so it was um, again quite quite interesting, and and this all all of these things that I think you'll find touch on like the resilience from like the younger years helping me throughout my career, and you know went to went to Saudi. Um, obviously, the option came up after that that good year um, with Kurz as the coach, and you know by by then I, I looked at I looked at it as okay, I'm 27. You know, could I potentially try and go to to Europe, or do I take the opportunity to to try and you know, set myself up. And, and at the time I hadn't really had many, many sniffs in, in Europe coming up. Um, and, and the Saudi option came up. And so I, I waited a little bit and, and then thought, all right, yeah, let's do it. Let's try this experience. Um, 
And in the first year, we again, we, we had a really good year. Um, we finished fourth, um, which had put us in an Asian Champions League spot. Um, I finished the, the season with four goals, 10 assists, um, made team of the season in, in quite a few of the, the media outlets and, and everything here. And um, during that period, we'd had, uh, we chained coach three times throughout the season. Um, and then coming into the new season, we, we had a new coach again. Um, <laughs> even though you came and, fourth. Yep. Even though we came fourth. Even though we came fourth, we literally had a, we had a coach at the start, um, at the start of the season. He did the preseason and did three games, uh, one loss, one draw, one win. Um, and he was sacked. And then we brought in uh, a Uruguayan coach, Daniel Carino, who was uh, really good and he did really well. Um, but for whatever, for whatever reason, had his differences, um, had his differences with um, obviously the, the people at the club um, and he got sacked. Um, and then we had a, a Saudi coach uh, um, for the remainder of the season before they brought in a, a Portuguese coach. Um, and to be honest, I can't remember his name, which is uh, probably a good thing. Um, but literally, um, so that was during during my first season there, halfway through the year was basically, um, co- that's when COVID hit. So coming into the um, coming into the second year, um, was obviously COVID was happening and, and everything like that. But, um, you know, this new coach came in and, and he wanted to, to bring in his own players. And I think there was a bit of um, arguments between the, the, the director um, and the coach. Um, the director didn't want me to go anywhere. Um, wanted me to stay, um, but in the end, they opted to um, go with the option that they did. Uh, they did want me to go, but the director um, said he wasn't going to sell me. He's like, "I'm not selling you. I don't want to get rid of you. So what I want to do is I want to extend your contract for another year um, and send you out on loan." And this was like a month before, uh, sorry, a week before the end of the transfer window. Um, and I'm sitting there going, "Like, all right, I don't know what to do." Um, do I want to sit here and, and try and fight it out and get my money or do I want to play? Like I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in a position where I, I don't want to sit on the bench for an entire season, go through this crap. I want to play. So I opted to go to Abba, but um, it was funny that, you know, when the, this coach came in and for a, for a good month of the preseason, hadn't said a word to me. And then we had a meeting like a week out from, um, this is when I obviously found out that just over a week out from going to, um, the the transfer window to end and, and the season to start and we gathered everyone into the, the change room for a meeting he gathered everyone into the change room everyone sat down and um, obviously we got we got like within the squad there's like multiple different languages so there's multiple translators and, and I've got a translator um, and <laughs> so the coach is speaking in Portuguese he writes all these names up on the board and he turns around and starts speaking and, and saying, like, this is my starting 11 um, for for the season. This is the way I see it. Um, and you're not going to change. You're not going to change my mind. Um, you know, this is this is what I think. And then he, he turns to me and, and starts speaking to me in Portuguese and, and pointing at me and, and says, Craig, this is getting translated to me. He goes, Craig, you're not my player. I don't want you in my side and you need to work work out with the club to go. And this is the first words he's spoken to me in, in a month. And literally in front of the whole team, he's called me out and said, I, I don't want you. And you have to work out with the club to go. And, and then he walked out. And I was sitting there and everyone kind of looked at me and was like, what did you do? What did you, what did you say to him? What have you, have you had, have you had problems with him? I was like, honestly, that's the first words he's spoken to me since he's been here. So yeah, obviously after that was, you know, that was, you know, challenging mentally in that, that kind of period. Um, you know, and then obviously opting to go to Abha, um, which is a much smaller city um, than Jeddah is a, ma- a major city. Um, so in, in Abha, no compound. Um, I was there with, with Caitlin. Um, and then I, we did, we, I had probably six months there. And to be honest, football-wise, it wasn't so bad. And, and the club was run reasonably well. I was playing, uh, played 16 games. We were sitting fifth on the ladder and, and doing quite well. But you know, during this period, um, Caitlin, had, we got pregnant, and you know, during during that time, we were trying to work out how to um, how to manage the situation. Whether we have the the baby in here in in Saudi, obviously, um, we were lucky that we still had the apartment here in in Jeddah. Caitlin was staying here. I was literally at times 
flying um, flying from Abha after training. We train at two, three o'clock. I go directly to the airport, fly to Jeddah, um, you know, go to a, a doctor's meeting with Caitlin, sleep the night, get back on the plane, fly to Abha, um, you know, go to training, go back to the airport, fly to, to um, Jeddah again, just to, just to try and work that out because, you know, Abha being much smaller, we weren't comfortable with the hospitals and everything that they have. And, and so it was a, that was a really challenging time. And then it got to the point where like with COVID going on, you know, trying to go through the pregnancy of first baby, we were literally like, nah, fuck this. Let's, let's go home. Not, not interested in, in doing this scenario. And, and so I spoke with, with Abha who were pretty good about it and, and, you know, allowed me to, to leave. I had to forego a bit of, um, a bit of salary to obviously to come back. So I'd paid back a bit of my salary to, to be able to leave. Um, and then obviously once I'd, once I'd done that, you know, look to, to try and sign, sign with Adelaide to, to be around family, mainly obviously initially for, for the pregnancy, but, um, I was still contracted on loan, um, from our weather. So, um, obviously I came back to, to Adelaide, played the three years or played the, the first year. Um, and, you know, we had actually got relegated, um, but the director was like, I'm, I don't want to lose you. I don't want to get rid of you. So let's, you know, let's re-sign your contract and um, you can come back when we're in the, the top division again. Um, and then, you know, I played the, the couple of years with Adelaide and then before last season, at the beginning of last season, we basically said, nah, not interested in, in going back. Let's just, let's just work out what we can do to, to stay, to stay at Adelaide and, you know, I had to, to fight a little bit with them and, and work that out with, with our weather. Um, and then obviously after last year, you know, I had probably my, my best season in professional football, you know, going to the World Cup, having a big impact, you know, winning the, the Johnny Warren. And then the director came again and, and said, no, nah, I want you back. And obviously it was a, a significantly an increased offer. And, and then obviously everything that's happened with, with Saudi football, um, you know, and the opportunity to play against some of the best players in the world. That's why I took the option um, to come back. But, you know, as, as you boys have known, as I've made publicly, it, it wasn't my first choice necessarily to come back. And I did actually want to to try and work out something with Adelaide to, to stay. But, you know, when that was made apparent that that wasn't an option, I had to take up this this opportunity to set myself and my family up for the rest of our lives. I think anyone would have. I think anyone would have done the same, to be honest. But I think yeah, that I, director I, obviously obviously rates you highly. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, I've got a I've got a good head. relationship. Yeah, I've got a good relationship with him. I think um to be honest, you you know what? I think it shows also how badly you wanted to stay at Adelaide because I probably would have been swimming to, to Saudi with, with a big offer to go and play against these players. I would have said, fuck Adelaide, I'm going straight to Saudi. So you obviously really wanted to stay. Um, it means a lot to you to play for the club. You were captain at the time, coming off the best season. And the king of Adelaide walking around had the keys to the city. Um, so I guess, is it something that, you know, when all of this stuff or where your contract ends in Saudi, as long as this director lets you leave, is Adelaide the, the place you'll be returning to? Do you think? Yeah, look, I think it's I think it's something I, I need to think about. Um, obviously, at, at this stage, I'm still in Saudi, and you know, discussing with um, my family of, of what we want to do. Obviously, I've got a let's say a deep connection with with Adelaide. You know, it's my hometown <clears throat> hometown city. It's where I grew up. You know, it's you know probably the the place where I've enjoyed my football the most. Um, but you never know what's going to happen in, in football. So, you know, I think as you boys will know, things can change very quickly and, you know, it's got to work down to, to circumstance. So, you know, obviously I'd, I'd love to be able to, to play with Adelaide again, um, but just need to, you know, take it as it comes and assess the situation. I've still got to finish this season and, and next season and, and see where we see where we go, and and what I feel is the the best possible move to to keep me within, I guess the the national team setup as well. Yeah, of course. Obviously, absolutely flying with that. It was a not bad goal that you you scored last week in Canberra. Yeah, it was nice. Um, 
obviously I missed the first game. I had COVID the week before, so I missed the first game against Lebanon in, in Sydney. So it was nice to be able to, I guess, overcome that and then be involved in the game. But yeah, definitely I feel like over the last the last couple of years since, you know, I've obviously had some, some really good seasons, but I feel over the last couple of years I've gone from confidence to, to confidence in terms of national team level as well and feel like I'm contributing heavily. So it's, you know, especially like now during these periods being in Saudi, the, the national team camps are uh, uh, amazing for me. It's a good refresh refresh of the brain to, to get outside of the environment, being, you know, I guess similar surroundings and, you know, it gives me a real passion for the game, which, you know, at times, sometimes in, in Saudi does become very challenging. Just quickly, I guess, before we, um, I think it's important to touch on the, the World Cup stuff, but while we're talking about Saudi right now, um, how has it changed since the first time you were there to now? Obviously, they've brought in a lot of big name stars um, to a lot of the other teams. How how has I guess the country changed in your eyes if, if it has and then also the league itself that was one of the questions that did come in like the standard I'm sure is much better now um, but yeah how's the the whole vibe around the the country and football there now um, yeah definitely in terms of differences in in terms of the city the infrastructure um, is starting to grow a lot more they've knocked down a lot of old buildings and. And, uh, you know, I guess maybe similar to, to Doha and, and Dubai at stages, it, there's massive construction going on everywhere. So there's, you know, unfinished buildings and everything that are going up. And, you know, the difference in just a short amount of time from maybe three, four years ago to, to now is, is massive. But I expect the, again, again, the difference in, in the cities and, and <clears throat> the, the structure to be massive over the next few years as well. Um, in terms of the football, Definitely a, a lot better than, than previously. Obviously, with the the caliber of player they're bringing over, is massively different. But again, like infrastructure wise within the league, they're they're making a lot of changes. So they're still in in that kind of you know transition phase of of trying to to bring in different people to make sure the leagues run um, in a better way. The clubs are more organised and everything like that. So you know, there's still a lot of trouble at, at the moment at, at multiple different clubs with you know, the, the way that the organisation is, the the difficulties they face, um, where they put their money, um, you know, the challenges in that because there's still teams that at times, you know, um, local players haven't, haven't been paid with for four or five months, um, you know, challenges of not having the best facilities, um, you know, all those types of things and, and medical medical things as well. So there's a lot of work to be done from, from those side, but in terms of football, um football perspective yeah definitely um you know style hasn't changed in terms of the style of play if you, you watch you know games for the against the socceroos for the middle eastern nations they're very similar to similar to that um very um very unstructured at times um and it's often the the top teams you know like your yeah, halals and nasas itihads alis they've they're, they've got the best foreigners and they've got the best local players so they've got the best and they've got good coaches as well. So they've got good team structure, good discipline um, to a certain extent. And, um, yeah, the, the quality is, is yeah, come on in, in leaps and bounds. It was good when I was here before, you know, but now I would say it probably is the, the strongest strongest league in Asia. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Let's, um, let's jump into some of the questions because I think reading some of them here, we, got, we are going to hear about the World Cup. Obviously, that's something that, that we need to touch on. And the first question that I'm going to read out from at Osul6. would love to hear Craig talk us through that moment at the World Cup. <laughs> um, we are. I'll describe it as probably the best, let's say, best 15, 20 minutes of my life until France uh, kicked into to second and third gear and, and overran us. Um, yeah, it was an incredible moment. Um, obviously, you know, I, I <clears throat> struggled a lot in, um, I guess the, the preseason and, and only had a one week, um, on field, um, on field training, uh, leading into that season. And so I'd come in very, very underdone into that, into that season. I'd started the first couple games uh, off the bench and, and really had to try and build, 
um, into it, obviously having the, the OP and, and struggling with that. Um, but, you know, me- mentally uh, my, my thought process was there was like, you know, this is potentially my last chance to, to get to a world cup. So, you know, that, that one moment of obviously lucky getting past this man and putting the ball cross and, you know, putting the ball on the back of the net was, you know, I guess a, an accumulation of like, your whole career and, and whole like in childhood, you know, when you're, you're kicking a ball around in, in your backyard and, and dreaming of, of moments like that. And you, you know, I don't know if you guys are the same, but sometimes you, you do your own, your own commentary when you, you score in your goals and, <laughs> and stuff like that, you know, just pissing around. And still does it now. Yeah. Just messing around, you know, you know, with, your, with my brother and my mates, um, so, you know, it's a very emotional, I guess, moment. And, you know, I think that definitely the, the best sporting moment of my life, being able to obviously score against the, at the time, the, the world champions, France, and, and go 1-0 up and to have my family there as well to, to experience it. And, yeah, it was incredible. Um, obviously, you know, I think the, the funny thing is, it's like, yeah, we, we ended up losing the game 4-1 and France, you know, really turned on, especially in the second half. But... Yeah, to be honest, I don't, I don't have any bad memories about that that game. I don't sit there and go, "Oh, I was, oh, I lost four one or, or whatever." You know, sometimes when you're scoring like a four one loss, it's, I guess it's kind of a a dampener moment. But being the opening goal in in the tournament, obviously for for Australia and and you know putting us in that in that position, yeah, it was incredible, incredible. What a feeling! Yeah, it's um. Crazy. Like, I think as you touched on, I think every kid, boy, girl growing up in Australia, growing up in the world in general, playing in a World Cup is the pinnacle. Of course, if you can get to the big teams, that's great. And Champions League and the Premier League is unbelievable. But the World Cup is, is the biggest tournament in the world. And to to score, being a, a, you know, a kid playing for, you know, Parrot Hills, Raiders, Enfield, all of these teams... And then to be on the world stage doing that is is insane. And it really should inspire everyone out there to know, you know, you could have been lost to the game if you did give up, you know, when you were 17, 18, 19. Instead, you you kept going plenty of challenges in that, you know, next seven, eight, nine years. But to get to that moment um, is, is incredible. So congratulations for that. Um, I was there actually watching us. I was with all, where, where all the family was and that. And seeing just I, everyone losing, it was just, fucking crazy um as a fan to be honest so yeah pretty pretty special um that will go thank you on to the next the next questions um and we don't want to pump your tires up too much because the head would be big enough um <laughs> oh, I'm modest, so, you know that. <laughs> yeah 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 no worries Eddie, and you love to lose as well <laughs> yeah that's a fact <laughs> um yeah. i think for me this one is is probably a good one from uh, Jacob zero one Oz. Hey, Goody. From a player's perspective, what does the governing body of the A League and clubs need to do better to help the league grow? Um, also, do you think the league should have done better to promote the soccer success at the World Cup and harnessing the momentum now that it's gone? Well, that's a big, big question. Um, to be honest, there's a, there's a lot of things that. Um, that could happen to, I guess, help um, the league and, and football in Australia. Um, you know, I think at times we we don't get the help from from the government at times that that I feel that that we need in terms of you know having the most participants at, at a junior level um, compared to any other sport and you know facilities in, in general and and that type of thing. I, I think. You know, it's, it's such a broad, broad question. But, you know, for me, the, the biggest thing I think, you know, clubs clubs can do and, and professional clubs can do is, you know, I find it baffling that, you know, a lot of clubs don't really um, have an academy or properly set up academy um, to have. Obviously, there's the pathway, um, you know, going through state teams, um, representative teams and, and stuff like that. But, you know, especially for, for A-League clubs, you know, obviously, first and foremost, you need the investment. That's got to be there. But if that's there, then, you know, you need to be, in my opinion, setting up a properly run academy so that you're able to, you know, control 
um, more the the type of players that are coming through and, and the players that, that you're getting to be able to have them in in a system um, from a young age, regardless of, you know, which club it is. For instance, if it's Adelaide, you know, if Adelaide are able to, to have an academy set up, you know, from at least the ages of 10 and from the ages of 10 getting in, you know, good good coaches and even having giving that having the pathway for ex players um, to be able to go into those positions to to give um, juniors good coaching and, and stuff like that but to be able to you know manage manage that and then try and produce I guess um, better players and then be able to to sell them on um, consistently I think that's probably the, the you know, realistically, geographically, where we are, that's one of the best ways for for A League clubs to be able to make money. Um, but it costs money to set up. You know, there's honestly there's there's so many things. You know, I think publicity wise, you know, I've always thought football never really gets the publicity it deserves. Um, you know, Socceroos um, and and the World Cup and and how we did was was fantastic. Obviously, there was the the situation in Melbourne and and that got so much more attention um, than you know, the success that we had at the World Cup. So, you know, I, I don't have I don't have the answers of exactly what we need to do, but there's so many things. But for for me the the one aspect of 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 um football in, in Australia that that needs addressing besides all of the other major issues is is definitely the the I guess the youth football and, and the youth pathways and, and set up because for me the the biggest difference in um, players when you get to the top level, whether it's um, European or Asia, the difference between Australian players at at the top level, in in my opinion, is the technical ability. I think for the most part, tactically, we match every team. Physically, we have good players. Um, But I think technically, it's it's the, it comes down to technical ability and having having that elite level of being able to, to do what you want with the ball it opens up so many more options and you'll watch, you know, top players. We all watch European players and, and the top players and they always seem like they have more space and time or they get out of difficult situations or, you know, those type of things, but they can create or, or do special things. And for me, it comes down to technical ability and, you know, the more technical ability that you have, the more you trust yourself to be able to to do um, certain things within the game and within situations. And I think that's when we get to senior level, I think that's the one thing that holds us back and, and not tactically, not physically, um, or not mentally either. I think it's that, that one area is the technical aspect from um, from us being able to, to make that jump for you know, competing against uh, other nations, but trying to, to hit that top level. And I think if technically we can produce better players and keep all of the physical, tactical things as, and mental things as well, then we're, we're going to um, progress as a nation. Yeah, well said. Good. I, I agree. Good because Adelaide, like when we when we were young boys coming up, I think it was, you know, all three of us would have dreamed to play for Adelaide United, but actually all three of us never got the opportunity with Adelaide United, which probably goes, you know, more about saying there was the talent there back then because we had a great crop, our age group. And then there was obviously, you know, guys like you who were a little bit older as well. But Adelaide, I don't think as as a club actually realized what they were developing back then and often, you know, let players go because, you know, all three of us could have come straight through the system, straight into Adelaide United, and we would have never had to go anywhere else. But because they weren't aware of it back then with the ownership or whatever it was, we, we were let go and had to go elsewhere and eventually all ended up coming back. But now I think Adelaide have actually realized, fuck, you know what? we've got so much local talent. We need to give these kids a crack because if we're teaching them from a younger age, they're going to be better by the time they get to us. And that's going to be better for us because we can maybe play these kids, sell them and make money. So I think there's still massive room for improvement, not just with Adelaide, with with all clubs, to be honest, in the A-League. But I think we're finally starting to understand the landscape of how important it is to actually develop these players from a young age instead of just hoping that the next wonder kid just lands on, on your doorstep and you can play him for a season, make some cash, and then off he goes. So hopefully there, yeah, will, be, there will be room for improvement and, and they continue to develop that and, and put the funding that, that they need to into the into the development phase of junior football. 
Yeah, I um, I don't know if we have time for any more questions unless there's one that kind of sticks out for you, Ben. We've kept him for long enough. He's uh... yeah, he's he's getting tired. I can see him. Oh, there's actually one other. You can just just answer it quickly because we have yeah, to done. ask. Um, where where is it? I'm looking for it here. Yeah, at Javi Lopez season, we have to ask it at Javi Lopez season. <laughs> um, who's the best player you've played against? Both all time and in the A League, I don't really care too much against about the A League, um, but I want to know. <laughs> I want to know who it is over there in Saudi. Unless it was someone in, unless it was some Stephen well, Messi Moore, in the World Cup. Team, I'm again, uh, in Holland. Yeah, well, I've been um, I've been lucky enough to play against both uh, both Messi and Ronaldo. Um, so obviously, look, obviously you put them in a different bracket, um, but. You know, I, I would probably say, I would pro, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put, I'd go those two players individually. Um, obviously, they're they're at older points in their career, so I wouldn't have, let's say, necessarily face them in their prime. But to be at the ages that they are and still dominating football the way they are is incredible. So I would say definitely Messi and Ronaldo. But um, I would say I won't put it into one player. I'll put it into a team. And to be honest, playing against France was just a, a step above honestly it's a, it's probably one of the only games where on the pitch at times you know you, you've you've felt helpless you know you're running around and you feel honestly you're like you feel like a headless shook you're like fucking hell like i can't get the ball i can't touch the ball and when we have the ball there's just like three players around us every time you're like fucking how like how how do they how do you, you almost got like questioning yourself at times like how do they do it how do they fucking do it like because you're just in the in the moment of the game, trying to trying to play and trying to like problem solve and work out, and just you know they seem to obviously bar the first twenty minutes, they adapted and and had all the answers, and, and no matter what we did, you know they managed to to bop it around, and I'd, you know what I, I'll say I'll say Mbappe as well, hundred percent. I've never seen anyone that has the the change of speed from standstill to to full speed the way that he did in that game. He was, he was fucking incredible. That's yeah. That's just ridiculous. Obviously you've played against probably. Yeah. The best, the best at, at the moment, probably like Mbappe, Messi, Ronaldo. You can't really ask for much better than that. So now that's, um, that's yeah. Unbelievable. And I think that's, we can end on that Steph. Yeah. Unless you've got anything else that you want for goodie. No, I think that's it. Orlando is... You I don't a, know if you, you guys can hear baby that, but He's <laughs> losing it in the background, so I'm trying to put myself on mute. So I think that's it. Um, no, nah, just good luck for the rest of the season. Good luck with all the Socceroos games, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to catch up in the off-season when you come back here. But, yeah, it's been uh, a joy to, to watch you kick on and do so well, and, and we really appreciate you coming on to the pod. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. appreciate your time and obviously being able to, I guess, share share my story a little bit. And you know, I think it's great what you you boys are doing with the podcast. And like you said before, guys, that it, it gives you know people a different side to be able to to hear things from a player's perspective and hear things behind the scenes. You know, rather than just you know outside looking in and and you know forming your own opinion. There's so many things that happen um, throughout everything, every single player's career and, and different stories. So it's, I think it's a good thing for people to be able to to hear them no we appreciate it goody thank you very much for jumping on and wish you all the best for the rest of the season and keep smashing it with the socceroos perfect thanks guys appreciate it football friends with ben and steph is proudly brought to you by the inner game journals started by none other than our co-host stephan moore the athlete performance journals were created to help athletes of all abilities become more self-aware through goal setting and reflection on or off the field the mental side of the game is so crucial to help you feel and perform at your best head over to www.theinnergamejournals.com and use code football friends to get 15 percent of all products if you're a club school or a Academy, you're in luck. Stefan also runs workshops and he's just released the app version, which will allow you to give direct feedback to players. Download the app for free today. Search the inner game on the App Store. Another great chat with one of our football friends, um, Big Craig Goody. Um, he uh, yeah, he went through 
in a lot of detail his his pathway. I think he was very generous with with his time. Um, hopefully, the listeners have managed to to sit through it all um, because it was a long a long episode. But he yeah he touched on a lot of really important points about you know that resilience and I guess putting in always the extra effort and and you know maybe his career. Um, didn't reach the the heights that some players does at the start, but you know you look at the back end now. His last two three years, player of the year in the A League, big money move to Saudi, and starring at the World Cup, and um, probably being the soccer's best player of the last you know two two to three years, you'd say. So it's um not been easy for him, but he's you know he's he's coming through at the end, and um, you can see the confidence in the way he plays, and even when he was talking, that you can see how sure of himself he is. Um, and it's great to see when when someone's obviously reached that reached that top level and um, and believes in themselves. So, what what did you take out of it? Yeah, well, I hope he doesn't charge us the same hourly rate that he's charging his club in Saudi. <laughs> or we fucking broke. We won't be able to do any more episodes. But <laughs> we'll nah, just let that one I run think, through to the keeper. Yeah, yeah. I think he's been generous with us. So, now nah, I I just look back at the the junior or his you know as he was trying to break through and all those setbacks all those times you know getting told that you're not good enough or i think you know you can just kind of brush over that and say oh well you know he's obviously got thick skin because he was able to make it in the end but that would have been hard you know to to go overseas trying opportunity you know doesn't come through then you go overseas again doesn't come through you go overseas again and then they tell you that they want you and then it doesn't work out and then through all of that as well, you're getting cut from state teams. You're going to Adelaide United youth team, getting told you're not good enough. Like, yeah, it, for me, that's just fucking mental. And to actually still be able to go on after that and have the career that he's had, you know, he, he might not have played, you know, in top leagues in Europe. But I think what he's done here in Australia, uh, you don't get to Saudi right now unless you're a top player because look at the money that they've got. Look at the players that are playing there. So, and what he's done, obviously, with the national team, you know, that goal of the World Cup is, yeah, that may, that's the kind of things that makes it all worth it. And, you know, that's the highlight of, of his career. I'm sure you won't probably get better than that. So, yeah, really good chat. We didn't actually touch too much on the KFC, but we should have asked what the, the secret herbs and spices are from the Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> He's done it all. He's actually done it all. He might, maybe, maybe when he comes back to Adelaide, uh, life after push. <laughs> he'll be back in there. Just an original recipe, mate. Yeah. I think he'll, um, I think more, more sensibly, he'll probably actually own a KFC franchise of his own. I don't think he'll be working at one. Yeah, exactly right. But no, it's, um, it's great. It's great to hear from someone like him. He's, he's, yeah, he's a great, a great guy, uh, more importantly, and, and someone that loves Adelaide. So um, I'm sure for the Adelaide United fans out there, I, I hope one day he will be back finishing his career in red. But I guess you never see, as he said, um, you know what, he might continue to do well over there and keep playing there, or he might test himself somewhere else. You never know, but you know, fingers crossed he ends up playing um, for Adelaide United one last time. And um, you know he'll go down as one of the best ever players to come through. Um, South Australia uh, had plenty of talented players, but he's definitely going to be right up there. So thank you all for listening in. Um, we've got a massive week of A-League football coming up. Um, so make sure you tune into all those games. Um, but that is it for now, a very long episode. And Ben will tell you exactly where you can find us on socials. Yeah, guys, we've got, obviously, my fourth, but unfortunately, will have to happen sometime this week. So keep your eyes peeled on our socials. They're at Football Friends Pod on Insta and TikTok, at Ben and Steph Pod on X, and Football Friends with Ben and Steph on YouTube if you'd like to see Steph wearing his hopeless Arsenal kit today. They drew last night. Liverpool are back top of the table. So it's not all doom and gloom for me this week, but... Thank you guys for listening in. We'll see you next week for another episode. Thanks, guys. Oh, Fred. Fuck you lot. Where's the beer?